This evening we're continuing our overview of the Old Testament book titled Psalms. With this as the focus, if you would, let's open our Bibles to Psalms chapter 24. And as we make our way to the 24th Psalm, I just want to take a moment to point out that this song, which was written by King David, this was the psalm that was sung every Sunday morning there at the Second Temple, which was built by those who returned from their Babylonian captivity. That's right, it was... Uh, you know, several centuries before the first advent of the Lord Jesus Christ, when the Levitical worship leaders of Israel, they would begin the week on Sunday with this very song of praise. And as the children of Israel gathered together there at the temple for the Sunday morning service, they would proclaim the praises of the Lord as they worshiped the King of glory with this psalm. It's also interesting to note that this would, would have been the song that they sang on Palm Sunday. Remember, this is the song they sang every Sunday. So on Palm Sunday, this was the song they were singing there on Temple Mount. And just to be clear, Palm Sunday is also known as the triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus. And the reason why? Well, this is the day when our Savior publicly revealed himself as the king who had come in peace with righteousness and salvation. And as the Lord Jesus ascended Temple Mount on that Palm Sunday, the people prepared to sing the lyrics of this very psalm that we're studying tonight. Now, with all that in mind, let's turn our attention now to the lyrics that we find here in the 24th Psalm. If you would look with me here, we'll begin reading at verse 1. Here, David writes, A psalm of David, the earth is the Lord's, and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters." Now here in the beginning of this psalm, we find King David. He's worshiping the one who has sovereign authority over the entire earth. The earth is the Lord's, he says. Or in other words, the earth belongs to Yahweh. And not only the earth, but everything on the earth. And and this includes every single person. You know, whether people recognize it or not, we all belong to Yahweh. I like the way that the scholars who created the Christian Standard Bible render verse 1, they put it like this. The earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants, belong to the Lord. More simply put, everything belongs to the Lord. And the reason why, well, it's due to the fact that he is the creator. He's the one who has given us our life and even every breath and everything that allows us to exist. This was precisely the point that King David went on to make there in verse 2. Here he assures his audience that the Lord has founded it, the earth, upon the seas and established it upon the waters. That's right, the Lord is the one who formed the dry land that he calls earth. And he's done this by also creating the boundaries for the seas and the oceans. This actually took place on the third day of creation according to the creation account that the Lord presented to Moses. This is actually found in Genesis chapter 1. Here we learn that God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, And it was so, and the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. This was the day that that King David was actually celebrating. David was celebrating this day when the Lord established the earth, which, you know, we call the earth the the, the full sphere or, or the flat disc, if you prefer. But, uh, but, you know, we, we call the, the, the entire sphere the earth. But here in Genesis 1, the Lord is referring to the dry land as earth and then the areas of water as the seas. And as King David celebrates, he, he sings the praises of the one who has established the foundations of the earth with the seas and the ocean currents, you know, and, and the separation of the two. Uh, Now, I realize that the world is filled with scientists who are trying to understand how the universe began to exist, and it's a a worthwhile endeavor. 
Some have assured us that the entirety of the universe was once a singularity that somehow exploded and expanded into what we see today. Others have introduced you know, competing theories that include the steady state theory or the simulation theory where they say, do we even exist? Aren't we just in a simulation and these sorts of things? There are those who would have us to believe in one of the various multiverse theories which has become very popular within DC movies. And yet all of these cosmological models fail to explain how our finite universe began to exist. Even if you go to something like a steady state theory where you know, it's always existed, well, well, if it's always existed, then it's infinite. And if it's infinite, then we would have never arrived at today because you can't traverse an infinite. If you try to go back to the beginning of infinity, you'll never get there, so you'd never get here. So all of these theories fail to actually explain how there can be an uncaused cause, which is why I say there's got to be an infinite God. It only stands to reason there must be an infinite God who set in motion the entirety of creation. And so with, with all these theories in mind, you know, whenever somebody tries to argue with you, you know, that there's no God and all this stuff just kind of happened by chance and these sorts of things, I would encourage you to direct them to the questions that our Creator presented to Job regarding the creation. It's actually found in Job chapter 38. Here the Lord presents Job with these questions. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst forth and issued from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band, when I fixed my limit for it and set bars and doors, when I said, this far you may come but no farther, and here your proud waves must stop. When it comes to the cosmological questions about our universe or, or the existence you know, of beings here on this earth, you know, we'd all do well to remember that our uncaused creator is the one who knows what he did and how he did it. And, and I'm not opposed to science. I'm not opposed to scientists engaging in you know, good scientific observation and, and these sorts of things. But listen, science is based on not only observation, but repeatability. And that's not something that we can do with the creation. Therefore, rather than looking for a scientific way to dismiss our infinite creator, we ought to instead sing the praises of the one who made the world and everything in it. I like the way that Paul explains this in Acts chapter 17. He's you know, there in Athens and he's, he's looking at all the idols uh, that they had there in Athens. And it was said that there were more idols in Athens than humans uh, at the period of time when Paul was there. And so it's here in Acts 17 where he decides to present them with information about the true creator God. And it's in beginning at verse 24 where he declares God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. Christian, listen, our God is the one who created the universe. He's the one who created everything in it. He's the one who gives us life and breath and all good things. But that being the case, it only makes sense for us to use our life for his glory. It only makes sense for us to use our breath to praise him. We should take everything that he has you know, given to us, all the good things that he's provided for us, we should use it all for the praises of the one who has created us for his glory. Not only that, but we should also sing the praises of the one who has 
who was sent to serve as our Savior. And to explain what I mean, let's pick up our study of the 24th Psalm. I want to direct your attention here to verse 3. Here King David asks, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, Selah. Now here in these verses we find King David, he's asking and answering an extremely important question here. And I want to take a closer look at the question that he poses there in verse 3. Here, again, he declares, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord or who may stand in his holy place? Now, as we consider these questions, I have no doubt that David was referring to the tabernacle that he placed there on Mount Zion. Before the temple was built, David you know, put together a, a, a new tabernacle and it was placed there on Mount Zion. And so when he asks, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord... Chances are he, he's got the tabernacle in mind. He's probably talking about the hill Zion, Mount Moriah. He's talking about Temple Mount. And at the same time, we must not forget that the holy tabernacle that was setting upon Mount Zion was actually then replaced by Solomon's temple. And, and both of these things were copies and shadows of the true sanctuary, which is actually found in heavenly places. With that being the case, David wasn't just asking about the tabernacle which was placed there on Mount Zion. No, instead, I believe he's probably asking about who is able to enter the Holy of Holies, which was there in heavenly places. Who is able to enter the heavenly sanctuary of Yahweh there in heavenly places? And it's here in, in this psalm where we find King David. He's correctly presenting the answer to the question. Notice again, verse 4. David goes on to say, He who has clean hands... And a pure heart, he who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. As we consider King David's answer to his own question, there should be no doubt in our minds that there's really only one who fits this description. And it's not us. Do any of us have clean hands? Now, before you bust out the Purell, you know, we're not necessarily talking about, you know, the dirt here on the earth. He's talking about clean hands, spiritually speaking, sinless hands, a pure heart. Do, do any of us have a pure heart? Is not the heart of the unbeliever wicked and, and, and desperately wicked and, and sinful? Who here has not lifted up his soul to an idol? Who here has never sworn deceitfully, meaning told a lie? Clearly, no one here fits this description. Can any of us then enter into the heavenly sanctuary of the Lord? Well, no, not without, not without help. So who is the one who fits this description? Well, clearly, this is a reference to our sinless Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one who alone has clean hands and a pure heart. Jesus is the one who alone has not lifted up his soul to an idol. Jesus is the one who alone has never sworn deceitfully. Therefore, Jesus alone is the high priest who was able to ascend not just to Temple Mount, but into the hill of Yahweh. He is the one who alone is able to enter the Holy of Holies on our behalf. Not only that, but Jesus is the one who alone has secured our salvation. And I want to consider how King David puts it here in the 24th Psalm. If you would, let's consider the next verse here. Look with me there at verse 5. Here he goes on to declare, He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Now, as we take a closer look at this verse, it's important to understand that the New King James Version, I don't think it's the best translation of the original Hebrew. And really, I kind of find all the translations to be just a, just a little bit, I don't know, skewed. One reason for saying this is, is due to the fact that the Hebrew word, which is rendered here in the beginning of verse 5, he shall receive, 
That phrase, he shall receive, is actually translated from one Hebrew word, which could also be translated lifted up. Yeah, so, so, so the beginning of this verse probably should read lifted up. And, and, and so let's move on to the next. The, the, the Hebrew word rendered blessed can also be used of those who make peace. Then there's the Hebrew word rendered righteousness, which also is used in reference to the justice that's achieved through the punishment of the wicked. So, so whenever, the, whenever, the, the punishment, uh, whenever a right punishment is poured out upon the wicked, that's when justice happens and that is righteous. Finally, the word his, that word his found at the end of verse 5, it's not found in the original Hebrew. With all this in mind, I believe that verse 5 might be better rendered in this way. Being lifted up, he makes peace with Yahweh by receiving justice from the God of salvation. Being lifted up, he makes peace with Yahweh by receiving justice from the God of salvation. In other words, I believe David here is pointing to the day when the one who is able to ascend into the hill of the Lord would be lifted up so that he could make peace between, God, between man and Yahweh by receiving the just punishment that we deserve so that we might receive the salvation that he secured for us. And this psalm falls on the heels of, remember, Psalm 23, which points to the pierced hands and feet of the Messiah. And so I see these psalms working together to help us to understand that there's an ultimate sacrifice being offered by our Savior to make peace between God and men so that our Messiah acts as a mediator, thereby enabling us to receive salvation by faith in him. If my take on this text is correct, then King David here, he's prophetically pointing to the day when our high priest would come and offer himself as a sinless sacrifice for us. And then after his sacrifice was completed, he would then enter into the true tabernacle of the Lord. I like the way that Paul actually explains all this in Hebrews, in the final verses of chapter 7 and in the beginning of chapter 8. There Paul declares, for such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priest men who have weakness, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the son who has been perfected forever. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. According to Paul, The Lord Jesus is our sinless high priest who has now entered the Holy of Holies there in heaven, the true tabernacle. And not only that, but he's the one who is currently seated, meaning his work is done. He's seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty there in the heavens. And it's for this reason that David then encouraged the descendants of Jacob that they needed to seek the face of our Savior so that they could enjoy these messianic blessings. Let's consider how King David puts it here in verse 6. There he declares, This is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, Selah. Once again, the New King James, I think, is a bit clunky here in the way that the scholars rendered the Hebrew. Uh, The scholars who created the Revised Standard Version, they translate the same Hebrew in this way. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob, Selah. The scholars who created the New International Version render the Hebrew in this way. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, God of Jacob. And the scholars who created the Christian Standard Bible, they render the original Hebrew in this way. Such is the generation of those who inquire of him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob, Selah. In other words, those who would seek the God of Jacob, those who seek the face of the Lord, are those who are also ready to receive the messianic blessings that are bestowed upon those who trust in the God of our salvation. It's for this reason that King David encouraged the children of Israel, the the descendants of Jacob, to look forward to the coming of the true King of Kings. 
Now, with this as the focus, I want to turn our attention back to the lyrics of this incredible psalm. And if you would look with me there, beginning at verse 7, here King David declares, Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Here in these verses, we find King David, he's describing this day when the king of glory would finally enter the the gates of Jerusalem. And according to David, this is going to be such a joyful celebration that the gates themselves are elated. That the gates themselves will cry out. Not only the gates of the city, but also he refers to these everlasting doors, which might possibly be a reference to the doors that lead us into eternity future. Where do we find everlasting doors here on, on the earth? Well, maybe maybe we're talking about the doors that lead into the, the, the tabernacle there on earth or the temple there on earth. But, but I'm guessing that these are everlasting doors, meaning doors to the everlasting. Just to make sure that there is no confusion about the identity of this glorious king, David describes the king of glory as the Lord. He calls him the Lord strong and mighty and the Lord mighty in battle. Seeing how this title, Lord, which is found there in verse 8, is written in all capitals, well, we recognize that David's using the proper name of God, Y-H-W-H, or yod heh vav or Yahweh. So Yahweh is the king of glory. Yahweh is not only our creator, he's the king of glory. And as we consider the way that David describes the king of glory as being both strong and mighty in battle, Well, I can't help but to consider the way that the king of kings will eventually return and destroy the enemies of Israel before entering the gates of Jerusalem at the time of his second coming. I like the way that the apostle John describes this in Revelation chapter 19. It's here where he declares, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Here in these verses we find John describing this day when the King of Kings will return. And it's at this point in time when the King of Glory will show himself to be strong and mighty in battle. And if I understand the events that will unfold during this final campaign at the time of Christ's second coming... Well, this is the day when our king will begin to wage this war in Edom, which is actually modern-day Jordan. As a matter of fact, it's Isaiah chapter 34, beginning at verse 5, where the Lord declares, My sword shall be bathed in heaven. Indeed, it shall come down on Edom and on the people of my curse for judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made overflowing with fatness. With the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra and a great slaughter in the land of Edom. The wild oxen shall come down with them, and the young bulls with the mighty bulls. Their land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust saturated with fatness. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance, the year of recompense for the cause. Of Zion. According to this prophetic promise, the king of glory is going to begin his final battle in the Trans Jordan area of Basra, which is about 20 miles south of the Dead Sea. And it's there where the Lord will begin to punish those who have surrounded the Israelites who uh, possibly seek shelter in the fortress city of Petra, which is right in that same area as Basra. So it's believed by some that the Israelites fleeing from Armageddon will head for Petra. It's even my understanding that there are Christian ministries who have buried Bibles 
in that area, which could potentially be found by the Israelites who are hiding there in Petra. But the idea is that when the Lord returns, he's not going straight to Jerusalem. He's going to Basra to save the Israelites who are there protecting themselves in Petra. And then the king of glory will begin to make his way northward across the Jordan as he leads the armies of heaven towards Jerusalem. And some believe that the armies of the Antichrist will try to stop Christ Jesus from reaching Jerusalem. Well, they'll quickly realize that they're outgunned, they're outmatched. There's no way to fight against the mighty king of glory. And as he makes his way to the city gates of Jerusalem, I can only imagine how we the armies of heaven, will begin to sing this 24th psalm as we declare, lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Without debate, the lyrics of this song are pointing to the day when the king of glory will return on a white war horse as he prepares to enter the gates of Jerusalem and then establish his millennial reign. At the same time, this same song was also sung on the day when our Savior entered the gates of Jerusalem, riding the foal of a donkey, which was also a symbol of a king coming in peace. During this period of time, if a king entered your city on a, on a war horse, that was a symbol of war. But if a king entered your city on a donkey... That was a symbol of peace. And so in, in, the, in the first advent of our Savior, Jesus enters the city of Jerusalem, enters the gates on a donkey. And with that, I want to consider the final stanza of this song. If you would look with me again here at the 24th Psalm, let's pick up our study beginning at verse 9. Here King David again declares, Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up, you everlasting doors. And the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory, Selah. Here in the final verses of this chapter, we find King David. He's singing the praises of the king of glory. And now he's looking forward to the day when the king of glory will enter the gates of Jerusalem as the Lord of hosts. Now, the word hosts is a translation from the Hebrew word sabaoth which simply speaks of, you know, the angelic armies of heaven. So, you know, this is the Lord of the armies of heaven. But it's also interesting to note that the scholars who created the New International Version, they render the words Yahweh of Sabbath uh, into our English word uh, Lord or Yahweh Almighty. I want to consider how these scholars who created the New, New International Version render verses 9 and 10. Here's how they put it. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors that the king of glory may come in. Who is he, this king of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the king of glory. In light of this translation, we can see that King David here, he's celebrating as he looks forward to this day when the Almighty One would enter the gates of Jerusalem. Now, that's, that's pretty incredible to imagine. And while we, we certainly you know, look forward to the day when the Lord Jesus will return to enter with his armies, we have to understand that it was on the day of our Savior's triumphal entry when the incarnate Lord Almighty entered the gates of Jerusalem according to the prophecy that the Lord revealed to the prophet Zechariah. It's in Zechariah chapter 9, beginning at verse 9, where the Lord declares, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations." His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. That's right, from the river to the sea. Jesus Christ is the king. And not just from the river to the sea, but from the sea to the sea. The king of kings is the king of kings. He is the king of glory. And the whole earth belongs to him. 
those who are trying to say that from the river to the sea, this belongs to these people or that people. No, no. It's all the Lord's. It belongs to him. And here in this prophecy, we find the Lord, he's prophetically revealing this day through the prophet Zechariah that there's coming this day when the king of glory would come into Jerusalem, not to make war, but to present peace. And so he enters on a young donkey. And it's interesting to note that the use of a donkey, <clears throat> as I pointed out, this is actually designed to signify the king coming in peace. And so the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, enters on a donkey during the first advent. And so as we consider these two stanzas, which are very similar and yet different enough, I can't help but to think about the first and the second coming of our Savior. And it was during the first coming, the first advent, when he entered Jerusalem, entered the gates of the city to bring peace on earth. And I should point out that the Lord Jesus actually fulfilled this prophecy on the day of his triumphal entry. As a matter of fact, it's in Matthew chapter 21. Here the apostle Matthew writes, Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethpage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and colt, laid their clothes on them, and sat him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Here are these verses we learned about this day when the Lord Jesus entered the gates of Jerusalem on the foal of a donkey. And in this way, he fulfilled the prophecy that we find in Zechariah chapter 9. Not only that, but remember, this is Palm Sunday. This took place on a Sunday. And with that being the case, we can be certain that they were, they were preparing to sing this very psalm, the 24th psalm, because this was the psalm that they sang on Sundays there in the morning service at the temple. And so as they're making their way up, they're singing Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But they're entering into the temple. They, they enter into the city, then they go into the temple, and the morning service would kick off with Psalm 24. And as Jesus is entering the gates of the temple, the multitudes are crying out, lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Can you imagine them singing that, those very lyrics as Jesus Christ enters the temple? As they cry out, who is this king of glory? There he is. That's him, the Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory, Selah. How incredible is that to imagine? Well, it was a week later when the Lord Jesus then fulfilled the role of the high priest as he offered himself a sacrifice for our sins. And after rising from the grave on the third day, it was 40 days later when our high priest then entered the Holy of Holies there in heaven. I like the way that Paul explains it in Hebrews chapter 9. There he declares, For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And that is, it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. That's right, the Lord Jesus not only entered the gates of Jerusalem during his first advent, but he's going to return a second time and enter the gates there of the city 
And it's at that point in time when he will establish his kingdom here on the earth as he rules and reigns from the throne of King David for a thousand years. That being the case, I encourage you, we, we, we should probably memorize, memorize this psalm, huh? I'm, I'm guessing we're going to be singing it as we enter into the gates of Jerusalem with our Savior. And as we return with the Lord Jesus Christ, and as we watch him destroying the armies of Israel and then entering the city, I believe that we'll probably be singing, Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up, you everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah.